Good evening, Cedar Grove. Welcome to Growing in the Word. Um, and we are glad that you have allowed us to come back into your homes to talk about Jesus Christ, Him crucified, and the Word of God. At this time, I'm going to ask Reverend James if she would open us up with a word of prayer. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, truly we thank you for allowing us to be present in this another day that you have made. Father, we're thankful for your presence with us, and we're thankful that we have the Holy Ghost to lead us in all things. We ask that you'll be with us, Lord, and bless each and every one of us as we open up your word to discuss it according to what thus saith the Lord. We give you praise and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And this evening it is my privilege and pleasure to uh, have this conversation with my friends first, uh, Pastor Rodney Till of the Jerusalem Baptist Church of Washington, D.C., and also Reverend Sandra James of the Cedar Grove Baptist Church of Moxville, North Carolina. So at this time, I'm going to ask if you guys would just further introduce yourself. Re uh, Pastor Teal. Uh, my name is Rodney Teal. I pastor the Jerusalem Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. I've served there since June of 2012. Uh, I have uh, uh, enjoyed my pastoral tenure. We're coming on now nine years, and it's been a blessed time. I know uh, Pastor Franks from our days at Virginia Tech. Uh, back in those days, I was the choir director at the First Baptist Church in Blacksburg, and uh, we came to know each other and work together, uh, serving there under the Reverend Dr. P.L. Barrett. Uh, and so I'm happy to be here, and I want to thank again Pastor Franks for the invitation to come. Amen. Reverend James. Yes, I am Sandra James, an associate minister at Cedar Grove Baptist Church, under the leadership of Pastor Mary and Frank. Um, yes, I am retired and proud to say that I'm blessed to be able to lay my hands on my granddaughter as she grows and matures. Amen. Thankful for being here to discuss the Word of God. Amen. And and her granddaughter is a cutie. Amen. <laughs> she is a cutie. Uh, at this time, uh, we have a few questions, um, and the first question that we have for discussion is, what is true financial stewardship? What is true financial stewardship? We're going to start with Pastor Till on this question. What is true financial stewardship? I think true financial stewardship has at least two parts. I think the first part uh, is trusting God. Um, that in order to be a good steward, you have to be willing to trust God uh, with your finances. Uh, and I believe trusting God means uh, being willing to give as God instructs. I think that's the, the first part is uh, trusting God. And the second part of financial stewardship it is uh, not just trusting God, uh, but also doing what God has asked. Um, and I think sometimes those are two different things. It's easy to say that we trust God, but that trust shows up really not in just what we say, but also in what we do. I think 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, beginning around verse 12, helps us uh, where Paul writes, for if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. Um, for I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance may also may supply your lack, that there be equality. Uh, I think uh, it's important to understand in terms of financial stewardship, that all of us live through seasons. Uh, sometimes there are seasons of plenty and there are seasons of lack. And in the, body, in the body of Christ, that what God is asking of us is that when we have more, we give more. Uh, and people talk about, you know, tithing and the importance uh, of tithing. 
um, tithing is a, is a is a great principle. Uh, and it's an important and a biblical principle. Um, but tithing is sometimes at odds, can be at odds with modern uh, financial reality. And so if if you don't have 10 percent that you can give uh, now, that perhaps that means that you don't give 10 percent because you don't have it. Uh, but then when you can give 30 percent, then you would give that amount that you have as opposed to being locked into this notion of uh, if I make $30,000 a year, then I give $3,000 to church and I got to figure out how to live off $27,000. Uh, and that may not be possible uh, in in your current circumstance. So I think it's, it's uh, important to have goals and to set godly goals, goals that reflect godly priorities uh, so that if you can't give your 10 percent now that you work toward getting in a financial place where you can mm -hmm. or where you give as much as you can. Uh, and I think the point here, as Paul writes uh, to the church at Corinth, is that we be able to help others with our giving so that when I'm giving out of my abundance, it helps cover for my brother or sister who doesn't have. And then when I don't have, my sister or brother who does have can help me out. And that way we we increase this notion of community uh, and also follow the principle of financial stewardship. Amen. Reverend James. Um, I just want to piggyback on that, um, the comment that you made about community. And you use the uh, Caribbean as an example, but I'm going to go over to Philippians, where Paul, uh, you know, Paul began the Philippian church. And the Philippians started out with maybe eight, six or seven or eight members. But at the time, Paul stressed to them that we should give. And he, uh, he highly talked about the Philippians because they gave really when they didn't have much. Mm -hmm. But I was also taught when I was growing up that if you don't have the 10%, that you can give God 10% of your time and working in the church until you are able to give the 10%. And as far as financial stewardship is concerned, we should always, I think, once we grow and mature in that aspect of giving, we know that everything belongs to God. So what we have, the 30, 60, or whatever it is, it all belongs to God. None of it belongs to us. But he only allows us or only asks us to give 10%, and we're left with the 90%. So when we it in our hearts to do that, then off the top of every check that we receive, every money that we receive, we know that 10% of it is going to look to the Lord. And the Word tells us that that's how we establish our relationship with Him or establish our covenant with Him. So, yes, yeah, you know, we may not be able to do it in certain seasons, but once we mature and learn and understand that the, the tithe is going to God. Once we make it up in our mind to give, then it, it has already left our bosom and it goes to the bosom of God or to the church. So the church can prosper and do the work that God has called us to do. Amen. I, 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 like, I like how both of you all have, have stated it and it kind of goes together. Uh, one that it, it's, it's about trusting God and and then, Reverend James, you brought in the fact that it's, it's when we come into a place of spiritual maturity that we can have that trust of God. Uh, a lot of times, some of the some of the times you see people fall out of the church is they fall out over matters of, of money. Uh, and and one of the things that 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 I've seen is that Jesus said, do the best that you can. Um, and and I'm, I'm recalling the widow's might. 
uh, that, that widow who came and she only had, I believe it was a pence, she only had a little bit, but she did the best that she could with what she had to give to the church. Um, but, but so often this becomes a point of contention um, in the church in terms of financial stewardship and, and, and in, in essence, your financial stewardship is a vow or an oath between you and God. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't want to believe that your, your pastor, your, 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 your presiding ministers peeking over your shoulder at all times, trying to make sure that you're giving enough for them. Uh, but your giving is for God and, and it's based on your spiritual maturity, your trust in God and knowing that in God is, is, is all. And he is in all, he is through all, and he, he is all. And he allows us to have our daily being. And so in, in return, uh, I, I believe, I grew up, I grew up Baptist, um, Pastor Till. And during the, during the offering time, um, the song that we would sing was, What shall I render? What shall I give? God has everything. Everything belongs to him. And, and, and that's so true. Uh, everything, even the activity of our limbs, he allows us to have that. And and when we give back, this is just uh, a, a, a sign, a symbol, a, a, just a, a small amount that we're giving back to him in appreciation for what he's already done for us. Other thoughts? All right, let's move on to our second question. The second question is, what is Hosanna? What is Hosanna? And we'll start this one with Reverend James. Reverend James, what is Hosanna? Well, I looked at the meaning of Hosanna, and the dictionary told me that it was the Greek form of a Hebrew word meaning Lord, save. And this word is used in the form of praise to God. And the scripture that I went back to was Matthew 21. Mm -hmm. Um, verse 9 and verse 15. The first portion of verse 9 is when uh, Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And the people shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, because they were glad to see him. Well, first of all, um, you know, he sent his disciples out to, to make ready the room. And then after um, he entered the, the city or entered the temple, he cleansed the temple because they were selling uh, all kinds of merchandise, and he put the people out and said they have turned his father's house into a den of thieves. And after he cleansed the temple, then the healing took place of the blind and the lame. And the Pharisees and the scribes were upset with him because he did that. But the people or the children shouted Hosanna at that time. And when the children shouted Hosanna, they were shouting Hosanna because of the healing that had taken place. And Jesus went so far as to say in verse 16 that prophecy was being fulfilled, fulfilled in the scripture because the children were praising God. And that's what it's all about is we worship and praise God for the things that he's done for us. Pastor Tio. Hosanna, um, I want to piggyback off of what Reverend James shared, the, the meaning of Hosanna as, as save, Lord, save now. And it comes uh, to us through, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, Psalm 118 and verse 25. Um, Psalm 118 verse 25 begins the last segment of that particular psalm uh, and and it reads save now that's where hosanna would be save now i pray O lord O lord i pray send now prosperity hmm. blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord we have blessed you from the house of the lord god is the lord and he has given us light bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar you are my god and i will praise you you are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, 
for his mercy endures forever. That this notion that Hosanna is both a prayer and a praise. It's a prayer for God's salvation, but it's also a praise of God. Uh, you can think of it as a praise on credit. It's a praise of God on credit in this sense. We praise God because we've asked God to save, but we praise God because we know that God does save, that God will save, that if we ask in faith, believing that God will do what we have asked, if it's in God's will. And so this notion of, of save now, Hosanna, became uh, in the Jewish tradition, the way in which uh, pilgrims would greet each other going uh, up uh, to the temple. So on high holy days that this, and, and so uh, we see it used again as Jesus comes into Jerusalem uh, in the triumphant entry, uh, that Hosanna greeting uh, a reminder and celebration at Passover uh, that just as God passed over uh, the, the Jews and gave them uh, victory, saved them from the Egyptians and from the death angel, that they would greet each other as a reminder that God had saved in the past. So when we call on God to save now, we're just asking God to do what God has already been doing. And so now, it is both prayer and it is praise. It serves as a reminder of the power of God mm -hmm. and, and reminds as that psalm closes, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. He's good because he is the God who saves now, not, not who will save us in two weeks, but God will save now. Whatever we need, God supplies. And so we can, we can pray to God and at the same time, we can praise God because God is the God who saves. And the text says uh, that this saving that God does in Psalm 118 and 25, this saving that God does is a saving that sends us prosperity. And that's not this prosperity that we hear from these prosperity preachers. That's not what this is about. This notion of prosperity has to do with God meeting our need in every conceivable way. So that when we pray to God, uh, we can pray to God asking for God to meet our need and, and be assured that God will do it because he's God. Mm. That's why the text keeps saying over that the Lord, Jehovah, the one whose name means I will be who I will be, that that God, will meet every need because whatever need we have, God has promised that he'll be that. And therefore God can save because God was healing before I got sick. Mm. So that that's how we, God, God didn't have to wait till I needed him to become what I needed. God knew what I would need in advance. So when I pray save now, I'm praying save now to a God who is already saved. And so Hosanna then becomes this, this shout of praise in addition to becoming our prayer to God and our prayer and our praise meet in God. Amen. That's, a, yeah, that's some shout material. Amen. Let me ask you, I, I know you wrote the book on praise, but let me ask you this. Um, oftentimes we talk about Hosanna and we say it's the highest praise. Um, would, would that be accurate to call it the highest praise? Um, you know, I, I struggle with the notion of highest praise because for something to be highest, that means something has to already have been designated higher. And so if something is higher, before you get to highest, that means that something is lower. So the use of these relative terms means something. Uh, and and, and it, to the extent we understand praise as a sacrifice, uh, the word of God says that obedience is better than sacrifice. So then uh, perhaps if we want to talk about what the highest praise is, it's being obedient to God. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
that we praise God uh, best when we are obedient to God. So, I mean, you know, th th there was uh, some years ago, people would talk about hallelujah is the highest praise. And hallel literally means praise in Hebrew. And Yah is God. And so hallelujah literally means praise, praise God. Uh, and there was this notion that it was the highest praise. But I, as I said, I struggle with that because if something is highest, that means we need to look for what's lowest. Mm. Uh, and so I prefer to think of all praise as being equal. That, and, and the great equalizer, uh, I think that the great equalizer of praise uh, is what shows up for us when we look at the text of Psalm 150. Uh, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That, that last praise the Lord is hallelujah. Every time you're reading in Psalm 150, hallelujah. But but when we talk about the highest praise, look at all the different kinds of praise that are included. If you praise him in his sanctuary, that's the highest praise. If you praise him in his firmament, means outdoors. Mm -hmm. you, you, that's the highest praise. If you just stop and praise him for the mighty acts God has done, that's the highest praise. If you praise him because he's great, that's the highest praise. If you praise him with the sound of the trumpet or the lute or the harp or in dancing or with timbrels or with stringed instruments or with loud cymbals or with clashing cymbals, however you do it, it's all hallelujah. It all falls under the hallelujah praise so that there is no highest praise. There's just praise. All right. And the all only right. thing that beats praise is obedience. That's all right. From Jane, do you have anything else on that? No, that's good. That's, ain't that good? <laughs> that's all right. It's, 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 and, and, and what it tells us is that we have various ways to praise God. So there ought not be any lack of praise for God. Amen. Um, our third question, what does it mean when the Bible says, I will make a table before you in the presence of your enemies? What does it mean when the Bible says, I will make a table before you in the presence of your enemies? Pastor Till. Um, that's a, a, a line from the 23rd Psalm that we're all, all familiar with. And I think it's important uh, in in reading that that text to understand uh, that the person who writes it, David, uh, is himself a shepherd with the shepherd's resume. Mm. And so as he writes to us about uh, what the Lord does in this psalm that literally begins, the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord is shepherding me. Therefore, I have everything I need that that this notion of preparing a table in the presence of enemies uh, it is a part of the poem that, that incorporates this shepherding image. And, and one of the things about this, this preparing a table uh, in the presence of enemies is from uh, ancient anthropology and archaeology uh, and cultural studies, one of the things that we know about shepherds and uh, sheep were that some shepherds would have a favorite sheep, a pet, if you will, or sh a sheep that needed care uh, that was beyond that which the, those in the regular flock would need. And so that shepherd would prepare a, a table that literally uh, sat on the shepherd's lap. This was the picture. Uh, and, and this table, like a, a flat surface where the shepherd would lay out the food for this sheep. And, and this sheep, as distinguished from all the others in the flock, 
would have the privilege of of being almost like a pet sheep that would eat from this table that sits in the shepherd's lap. The beauty of this picture uh, in particular is that the Lord's lap is so big that we all got a table and can eat at the same time, Mm -hmm. that that each of us is treated as a favored sheep by God. And we can go and eat at, at a table that the Lord has prepared for us, his individual favorite sheep. And God is so much God that that God can feed all of us on his lap, seated, while enemies are all around mm. and there's no danger for the sheep and the shepherd ain't scared either. That That's that's this picture. I mean, you got the, the, this table in the presence of my enemies, it means all, enemies all around and the shepherd is chilling. He's just sitting there letting the sheep eat. And the enemy is sitting around watching the sheep but they can't get to the sheep because the shepherd is present and the shepherd is present and, and his rod and staff are at hand. Mm. The, the, the rod that beats back the enemy uh, and the staff that lifts up the sheep, all of the instruments of God's protection are at hand so that God can sit there and chill with all of his sheep eating at a table big enough. That means this table is so big that God can can feed all of us, and we ain't bumping into each other. That, I mean that that's I mean that's 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 what this picture is. That that God has everything that we need. We can eat at the table and not be in any danger in the presence of my enemies. But I'm not in any danger because I'm in the presence of the shepherd and the presence of the shepherd trumps the presence of my enemies. Mm -hmm. And because I'm in the presence of the shepherd, I don't have to be afraid, but also know that this shepherd is not afraid of my enemies. I mean, that's, that's so important. I think because it says something about the quality of the shepherd that he's chilling. I'm, I'm eating. The shepherd is chilling and the only person who is really bothered is the enemy because they're trying to get to me and can't. Mm. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's the beauty of the shepherd sheep relationship and the way in which God offers his protection to us. Amen. Real James. I almost don't have anything to add to that, but I, I will um, I will chime in and say that this confidence that David had, not only can he have it or does he have it, we can have it as well. That's right. Confidence. Amen. Knowing our shepherd is with us always. He said he'd never leave us or forsake us. He's our provider, which has already been stated. So what... What do we have to fear when we have our shepherd right beside of us? It's all right. I, I think that yeah, as, as as both of you have mentioned, you can't have the you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy without mentioning I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Uh, being on the same side as the shepherd, brothers and sisters, we have nothing to fear. We, we don't have to fear what evil may come. And and we've lived through some times where we've seen evil rise up. Uh, this past year, 2020, we've seen evil rising up. Uh, but our, our response to evil should not be fear. As long as we got God with us, as long as we're walking with the shepherd, we shouldn't respond to evil with fear. Uh, as Pastor Till said, we, we can sit down, chill, Eat from the table because God is with us. And if you need to be confident, be confident in the fact that he has all the tools and he's not afraid. He has the the staff and the rod. He's not afraid. So we shouldn't be afraid either. Amen. Y'all all right. 
Um, our last question. How important is it that we honor the Sabbath? How important is it that we honor the Sabbath? We'll start with you, Reverend James. How important is it that we honor the Sabbath? Well, um, we know back in the Old Testament that the children of Israel were given the Ten Commandments. And the, one of the commandments was to honor the, to keep the, the whole Sabbath day to make it holy. And they, God gave them that commandment because he had rescued them from the Egyptians. And they were to rest on the Sabbath day. Now, when we come to the New Testament, I find that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So, with that being said, we know that Christ, or I see that Christ was the foreshadow of the Sabbath. Because he said he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And being the Lord of the Sabbath, he could do anything he wanted to do on the Sabbath because he created the Sabbath. And the the confusion came in when the Sadducees and, and the, the Pharisees and the scribes wanted to know why was he healing on the Sabbath day. Well, he was healing on the Sabbath day because he was the Lord, God Almighty. He healed, he set free, and he was soon to go to the cross. Now, after he went to the cross, that's where his, the redemption of us came in because we were enslaved to sin no way out but christ set us free through his blood he shed his blood the bible tells us that without the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sin but he also told us that we had to believe that he came to rescue us or save us so when we believe we remember that christ has already saved us and I think the Sabbath day, keeping it holy, I think when Christ rose on the first day of the week, we celebrate or we reverence Sunday as, as our, our Sabbath day. But really, with Christ being the Sabbath, then we're just supposed to rest in him because he's already finished all of the law. He said he didn't come to, to do away with the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill it. So he fulfilled everything that we couldn't do. There were over 600 and some odd laws, but the people couldn't keep us. We know that the laws were put in place to show us what we were slipping up at. But Christ died for us because we didn't have any way of redeeming ourselves. We can keep the law, but Christ kept it for us. He died in our place so that we could come back to the Father. And that's my interpretation of the Sabbath. I think Christ is our Sabbath now. And we honor him as being our Sabbath. All right. Pastor Till. I think, um, think uh, thanks Reverend James. I think that's a wonderful uh, explanation, this notion of Christ as Sabbath. Um, Sabbath comes to us uh, as a as a principle uh, that is highlighted in the first book of the Bible, in its first chapter, uh, where we see God creating the heavens and the earth in six days, and on the seventh day, God resting not because God was tired, but because God knew that everything God created would need rest. Mm. And so God did not create rest because God needed it. God created rest because creation needed it. Nothing in creation can go on and on and on without rest. And so God being mindful of the limitations on that which God created created Sabbath so that we would remember to rest and in remembering our need to rest, remember 
the God who doesn't need to rest. Uh, and, and that principle of Sabbath is both a principle that allows us to rest because we need it, but that also promotes us uh, to remember the God who does not need Sabbath. Uh, that's, again, when we talk, as Reverend James did, about Jesus being the Lord of Sabbath. Sabbath was created for humankind, uh, not for God. Uh, I think that's important to remember. We just uh, finished up at the Jerusalem Church a review of the Articles of Faith. That was our Bible study for the last several uh, weeks. And we've all, we're working now in the Baptist distinctives. I decided to do a class for us on Baptist Bible basics. What do, do Baptists believe and why? Uh, Article 15 of the Articles of Faith, the Baptist Church, uh, Article 15 says, we believe the scriptures teach that the first day of the week is the Lord's Day or Christian Sabbath and is to be kept sacred to religious purposes by abstaining from all secular label and sinful recreation by the devout observance of all means of grace, both private and public, and by preparation for that rest that remains for the people of God. And the reason that I lift that up is uh, that the original Sabbath was treated as what we know today as Saturday, uh, really. Uh, and, and then you got to go back to Genesis uh, chapter one, which says that the cycle of the day is evening and morning. So that evening and morning were the first day, evening and morning were the second day. So in the Hebrew mind, uh, day begins when, the, when, it's, when uh, dusk settles. Uh, and so uh, the original Sabbath was really Friday night uh, into uh, Saturday, up till Saturday night. Uh, the reason that I uh, bring that up is because that was the Sabbath uh, under uh, under the law. Uh, coming into the New Testament, uh, Christendom adopts a different Sabbath, a different day of rest. Uh, in originally, uh, when the church uh, was uh, a, a split, if you will, from from the Jewish faith. Uh, Jewish Christians worshipped in the synagogue on Saturday, and then worshipped in church on Sunday. And the reason that Sunday was adopted was because many of the you number know, one, the Jews had already set aside Saturday as their day of worship. That's the first thing as a practical matter, but as a second matter. Uh, it, we, we use Sunday uh, as Sabbath because Sunday is, number one, the day Jesus rose from the dead. He arose Sunday morning. And number two, Sunday is the day of Pentecost. It, it, Pentecost literally means 50 days. It was 50 days after the Passover ended. The Passover ended on Saturday night. So 50 days from a Saturday brings you to a Sunday. 50 days, every seven days, you get back to Saturday. So you do that seven times, that's the 49th day. That means the day of Pentecost was on a Sunday. So when we come together on Sunday mornings, each Sunday that we come together uh, for worship, we are remembering the resurrection of Christ and re remembering uh, the day of Pentecost. And and because of those, uh, those things happening on Sunday, we now use Sunday as the day of rest, but it's not just rest. Sabbath is supposed to be not just about going somewhere and sitting down, which is important, but it's also the day that we remember the God who doesn't need to rest. Mm. And so we come up with this, this Sabbath principle that ought to inform us. And that's why I'm not such a big... Uh, I, I, I read the uh, article 15 of the Articles of Faith, and, and I remember growing up, and you weren't supposed to work on Saturday. Uh, and if somebody had a job on Saturday, that was a big deal, you know, having a job, having to work on Saturday. But I tell the people at Jerusalem, listen, whatever day they tell you go to work, go to work. 
you you go to work when they tell you to go to work so you can have a job. Uh, that, now, if you have the option of not working uh, on on uh, on Sunday, that's great. You exercise that option. But if you don't exercise the principle of Sabbath, which means you need to take some days off. You, and the reason for that is that your body and your mind and your soul need rest. But using that principle of rest is not just the time for me to go to sleep. It's also a time for me to remember the God who made me and who doesn't need to rest. So I think it's a balance there. And I think Reverend James sums it up very eloquently when she reminds us that that rest, that Sabbath, that reverence for God finds its home in Jesus Christ. That, that if Jesus is our Sabbath, then we ought to rest and therefore worship in him. Amen. I, 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 to I wholeheartedly agree. Um, in, in, in terms of worship, in terms of, of reverence, there ought to be a time set aside. If you if you can't worship and reverence the Lord on, on Sunday, then find a time where you can worship and reverence the Lord um, outside of outside of your daily worship of him. Um, set aside a time. And, and one of the issues that, that basically comes up that, that, that you mentioned, Pastor Till, is, is this idea of every creature needs rest. Everybody needs rest. And sometimes when you look in the church, you, you find that um, we're some of the most overworked people, non-resting people that you can find is in the church. Uh, even, amongst, even amongst ministers, ministers don't get as much rest. Uh, but I think it's important. I, I, I was paying attention to your city, and as a pastor in your city, he took, he took a rest from pastoring of his, of his church uh, at the Alfred Street Baptist Church um, for a time before the pandemic uh, because he, he saw the need for rest. Um, I think, it, I think it, it behooves us to, to, to keep up with ourselves in, in not just the spiritual sense but also the physical sense because you can be absolutely no good to anybody if if your body gives out on you uh, from not being able to receive rest a any other thoughts as as we close on that amen well uh, it has definitely been our pleasure to to have you both to be a part of the Growing in the Word um, fellowship. I, I would hope that that I'm extending an invitation for you to come back again uh, at another time because this has been very fruitful. I think that uh, the City Grove family has been blessed, and and so has all who will see this broadcast. Uh, so at this time, let us close in a word of prayer. Precious God, our Father, we thank you. We love you for your goodness, your kindness that you've shown towards us. Father God, we thank you for just being our God. We thank you for walking with us. We thank you for protecting us. We thank you for keeping us. We thank you for being our shepherd and allowing us to have that peace that passes all understanding. Now, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would take these conversations, take uh, this word that we've learned today, Lord, and just apply to our hearts to help us to be better servants of thine. Bless us, we pray. Lord, we ask that you would just surround us with your angels as we go about our way. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for the invitation, Pastor Franks, and it was a pleasure to meet you, Reverend James. Thank you. And likewise,